Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. I want to say thank you for you know having me here. The organizers of Code Blue, to Kana and her team, and to my very good friend um, Daiki, who actually I said is the culprit. Is is the reason I'm here. I, I met Daiki in 2015 when we worked um, an international case together and. Um, I finally had the opportunity to put a face, um, you know, to the name. And the reason that case was successful is the reason I'm here to talk about the international collaboration, a tool for combating cybercrime. First, I'd like to take a survey. How many of us here know about um, mutual legal assistance or treaty, the MLAT treaty? If you know, can you just signify by raising your hand? OK. Well, that's um, the formal way where a country can talk to another country and pass information and do investigation. That is um, the formal channel. But unfortunately, it's a very, very slow process. A lot of the time, it doesn't work, not because it's um, maybe different reasons. and. Um, it hasn't been very effective when it comes to cybercrime investigation. As we all know, cybercrime investigation is time bound. We're talking about IPs that are dynamic. We're talking about information that if it's not uh, you know, harnessed immediately, you might not be able to get it. The last speaker talked about servers. And um, how about a situation where the person who actually, after he made so much money out of the, the crime, takes off to a place where you can find him. The end of the investigation, you are also unable to get the mastermind. So I'll take a quick rundown of my presentation. I take a second survey. How many of us ever know, has ever heard about the EFCC? OK, just a very small. So I'm going to talk about the EFCC, the agency I represent. I'll talk a bit about myself. and. Um, there's a notion that Nigeria has the monopoly of cybercrime or the business email compromise. So I'm going to, for that reason, I'm going to give you a rundown of a, a little history and some information you might need to know. I'll tell you about what the EFCC does, and um, I'll discuss some problems that we also have seen in the area of cybercrime investigation. I'll talk about the real meat of my presentation, which is collaboration, an instance of what collaboration was able to achieve. And then uh, I'll, f I'll, I'll run through and finish up my presentation. Now, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, um, was born in, two, in 2003 because of the same reasons you have been talking about why are a lot of cybercrime activities coming out of Nigeria? And to that effect, this agency, the EFCC, is empowered to investigate and prosecute all economic and financial crimes. We're like um, we're law, federal law enforcement agency, just like the Nigerian police force, but our purview is streamlined to you know, economic and financial crimes uh, you know, matters. And um, we received complaint, complaints from, you know, different quotas. We have a, f a website where you can send, you know, complaints. You can channel your complaints to directly. You also, we also have, you know, the, the situation whereby people who are within Nigeria can do us a formal petition and drop at any of our offices. And um, to that effect, we also enforce anything that has to do with economic and financial crimes related matters. Our offices are 11, we're pretty very small uh, across uh, the entire uh, country of Nigeria. You might not have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, we're policing nearly 200 million people. I know of the population of Japan to be about um, 120 something million. So Japan is almost about the half of Nigeria. So you are, you are, you're imagining you know, a, a police formation that is, uh, you know, 
pretty small and tasked with a lot of, you know, uh, job to do in terms of combating this uh, serious menace. And I shall be talking about another thing we do again is partnering with law, local and foreign law enforcement agencies. And um, that's why I'll take my third survey. Are you a police officer in Japan? Can I just see your hand up? Police officer or a law enforcement person in Japan? Okay, maybe at the end of the, my presentation, I'll be happy to, to have friends with the law enforcement people in Japan. It's um, pretty important to us as part of what we, we do in order to achieve successes. Now, these are the offices we have. Like I said, there are 11. We have the headquarters office in the Federal Capital Territory, which is Abuja. We have the next big office, which is in Lagos, a metropolitan state uh, towards the southwest of Nigeria. It's um, about the, the action spot of my agency, and that's where I work out from. Um, a bit about myself, I have a background in computer science, and um, I've been with the agency since 2009 to date, and um, worked many cases, local and, and international. I've also had um, background in um, digital forensics, and um, just before I left, I was heading the digital forensics lab in Lagos office. But at the moment, I'm studying in Harlem University in South Korea. So I'm actually your neighbor just two, two hours away. And um, there I'm doing my master's program. Very good. A bit of history, like I said. Africa, a lot of people ask, is Africa a country? No, Africa is a continent. We, Africa has, um, you know, consists of about 54 countries. And has a very large population, 1.2 billion people, um, and has a lot of history like uh, I've written there. Very importantly, Africa has uh, the African Union, and something that is unique about Africa is that uh, we got colonized by maybe the West, Europe, and all that. So whichever country colonized you, that's the language that is predominantly spoken. So Nigeria was colonized by the English, so we speak predominantly English. You have Arabic, you have Portuguese, you have um, French, as the case may be. Um, if you look at Africa, it's divided into sub-regions. You have the North Africa, you have the Southern Africa, you have the Eastern Africa. Nigeria is found in the Western Africa. You have the Middle Africa. And you have it's a pretty interesting history, if you can find time to go through it. Um, like I said, Nigeria is found in the Western Africa, and it's, it's actually the most populated country in Africa. Um, an overview of Nigeria, that's Nigeria there. You have a land mass of 923, about that, kilometers. Uh, you, know. you have a population of... Uh, um, 195 million, that's been conservative, we're about 200 million. Um, we have a large usage of the internet and about 77% of, of our banks and um, financial institutions run on the internet. Like I said, the, in terms of internet penetration, you have Nigeria topping in the region there about that, and that's about that. That, that was a record of 2014. It grew to 80 million users. So you have an idea why you have a lot of users that um, have access to the internet and are able to do so many things on the internet. In fact, the population of um, the internet users alone is even over some countries. Like Korea has a population of, um, I think about 14 million or thereabout. The state, Lagos, where I'm working from, has a population of 22 million people. So that state alone is bigger than a country. So you can expect a lot of internet activities coming out of Nigeria. The history of the internet fraud in Nigeria and what the EFCC has been able to carry out since its birth is that 
internet fraud actually dated back into the 1980s and um, it started very traditional where it was then known as doubling of money um, local you know talents is called wash wash it means um, somebody will tell you show you some sort of chemical and he quickly does it you don't even know he puts it in the chemical then brings out a dollar bill and tells you if you can pay some money I will double the money for you and all will be yours so people reached out to go and get monies from their families they, don't worry borrow me money the moment I you know by tomorrow I'll give you your money back so that was how you know it started gradually and it progressed in the early 2000s to skills of social engineering where they go online and you see romance scam where they begin to reach out to people online you hear of inheritance scam someone telling you I have a very big asset somewhere uh, all I just need you to do is to send me some money and I will um, you know clear the, the, the inheritance and I'll give you a percentage I could even give you an interest and that was working like I said romance scam you have people who maybe lonely and um, or have relationships that have been broken and then they reach out to this kind of uh, category of people and then the fall for the scam sometimes they impersonate military personnel and you know lover people and then they reach out to vulnerable vulnerable people and take advantage of them some could be contract scam and some could be job scam so these things were what we were observing in the early 2000s it uh, moved on to the kind of scheme we see in 2010 and thereabout became more sophisticated where you have the use of you know more technical skills like DDoS attack worms viruses and you know defacement of websites was predominant about that time and then they could get some tools off the shelf already developed tools that they could just get at no co almost no cost to deploy through the dark web so these were the trends we're seeing Nigeria particularly what we what the trend we observed the real bedline of it was for financial purposes they just wanted to make money um, with a lot of excuses some tell you the, the because we're poor oh yeah and that's where I'm also from and uh, some tell you they we don't have parents who can take care of us well yes is, yours is even better I also lost my father too so you see there's really the, 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 the real essence of it is for financial benefits we saw different um, categories of this crime some people acted all by themselves that was what we, we saw but others acted in a group they had a more organized group where they, they were well structured the person on top is the chairman or the orga as it is called and he he breaks the task down some people bring in the vulner vulnerably uh, you know the vulnerable people and then some people could take over and do the attacks so we saw all of this kind of structures then the business email compromise com came in where we saw in 2015 which was about the peak of it all you know also known as um, CEO fraud man in the middle attack was also very predominant too uh, these are the kinds of schemes we saw the sorry I'll go back a bit we saw you know the use of key loggers and I'm, some of us may be aware of that spare phishing use of Trojan viruses of uh, Trojan and uh, malwares were also predominant these were the kind of things were seen I took this um, survey from Trend Micro. Pretty, very much what we were seeing progressed up onto up onto that time where we saw a lot of activities coming out. You know, just the trend as we were seeing it. And then between 2012 and 2018, we saw, like like I just explained. Now, what is the position of the Nigerian state in in response to cybercrime? In 2015, they, they passed the bill called the Cybercrime Act, and this was very much tailored, you know, a tool we have that is pr 
very, very much tailored to the current crimes we see in cybercrime. So it is very, is punishable. So anyone caught committing cybercrime home or abroad is culpable and is punish, you know, punished for it. So the Nigerian community is completely against cybercrime. Two, we have the Advanced Free Fraud Act, and that act to also penalizes anybody who is even um, aiding and abating cybercrime. So it's 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 uh, it's it's not enough that um, you claim your activities. Uh, you need to you need to do much more to show that you did not support the action of cybercrime. So in Nigeria, it is seriously frowned at. And the Establishment Act of the Economic and Financial Crimes um, is also very, very important a tool. And with that, we've been able to achieve a lot of um, activities in terms of combating cybercrime. So basically, we cause investigation. We arrest the, per the perpetrators. We prosecute them. That's our main goal and our joy. We importantly we restitute whatever we you know assets that are traceable to the offense that has been committed we restitute to the victims now i put federation there because besides cybercrime there are other things that the efcc does you know in white collar crimes that the efcc does including corruption cases and all of that so basically that we do a lot of that too so if you have corrupt officials who who, who took government funds you know, those funds will be repatriated back, you know, refunded back to the federal government. So that's what the EFCC does. Um, in 2015, that's the record uh, of um, the executive chairman, you know, trying to, let's say, was, was published. Pu published um, there was a return of money to a Polish victim who lost money, and several others. There's so many of them. I just picked uh, one out of them. Now, to the problem of cybercrime, particularly BEC, the agency called the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the United States recorded in 2017 from what they receive as reports of losses in cybercrime. And it was 675 million US dollars. I, again, I say that's just the FBI. We've not talked about what Asia records in terms of losses to cybercrime. There's a report there, and that's in 2018, August, of sharp rise in business, business email compromise. The point again is that it is not going down. Why is it not going down? Because this business brings in a lot of money, almost at no risk. If you're, whatever job you are doing currently, there are risks and yet you do them because you get some benefits. Now, these guys do this thing with a lot of motivation. So the point again is that if you are looking at you know, cybercrime going down, sorry, you will be disappointed. If you are thinking the trend will go down because we're here in a conference, I'm sorry to tell you that these guys make 12.5 billion in scam, in, in, in income. And then you tell them to go away. You know, the Nichols spoke about uh, you know a tweet where he said, "I can't face the you know the the feds." Yes, because if uh, whatever term he serves and he has this as a backup plan is a good investment, I tell you. So for us in this community, have this at the back of your mind that we are up against something that is pretty very tall. And what is the best way to? to work at it and bring it to a halt. Well, reduce it largely. So, like I said, it's very, very, you know, unreported, like all these records they have to show for it. Um, Trend Micro again says the business email compromise is on the rise. Everywhere it is on the rise. So what the losses cuts across every continent. So if, you, if you're thinking that uh, Maybe the losses are just for victims from U.S. Uh, you may be very disappointed that you may have lo you know, losses to record recorded here too in Japan and maybe any other Asian country or your con or country where you, you come from. What problem do we see 
again, as a reason why we are unable to achieve very much, is that we walk, you know, in silos. You walk as an individual. You are self-sufficient. And unfortunately, our laws haven't helped us very much. Our laws are more centered on, you know, your country and, um, you know, pretty much um, selfish. So it hasn't helped us. So you, you have somebody walking in cybercrime. He's just there all by himself. Even in the same country, you have different agencies. They just don't talk to each other. It's a lot of problem. Not to even talk about them communicating with other stakeholders like the private sector and um, the academia. So the walking in silos is a big problem, huge problem that, you know, at the end of a conference like this, the complimentary card you get to exchange with someone, you know, you, or you receive some from someone shouldn't just end, you know, like another paper in your shelf, but let's work it out. Let's put it to use. Talk to someone. Talk, let him talk to you. Share information, and we will be able to do more. Walls of jurisdiction, like I said, the laws are just, you know, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, maybe none of us was here was introduced as um, a legislator in his uh, country, of course, because, uh, you know, that's the, those are the lawmakers. And there's, if, if, if you are not a lawmaker, then the truth is that there's nothing you can do about changing the law. So if there's nothing you can do about changing the law, then how can we work together, you know, to get this job done? If you were a law enforcement person, you just like uh, Nicole talked again, she said you are the last, you know, line of defense. You are expected whatever intelligence the private sectors gather. It's you it's transmitted to. Now, how about when, it, when this crime happens beyond your border? Do you also have powers to execute, you, you know, your, 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 you know, your, the, the strength of your country? Is it, are you able to, to carry it beyond Japan or carry it beyond any other country? Not at all. So if we have laws that allows only for MLAT, which takes almost forever to achieve. The point I'm driving, it is, uh, driving at is that there are all, be, there's another channel by which we can walk, and that channel is what I'm proposing, which is, we, we all know, walking together. So walking together will help us to achieve even when these walls of our laws are there and there's nothing you can do about that. We have low information sharing, like I said, you know, we hardly talk to each other. And um, Nicole just said mostly what I wanted to say. You have the law enforcement people knowing next to no nothing. Like I said, in 2003, you, it was the birth of the EFCC. The more traditional police people did not know very much about investigating, you know, cybercrime. And even it still is the situation up, even up, up until date, until younger people came in into the system, uh, you know, it was pretty, and it is still very difficult for them to understand what an IP is. You know, I had a friend who told me that he was taught how to write in one, two, three, that's numbers, and A, B, C for the English-speaking people. And now they combine things together and then confuse him. So he doesn't like sciences. So there are so many people who are out there too who get confused when you're talking about IP. I, oh, Lord, what is this? I prefer to do, you know, murder cases. I prefer to do robbery cases. They are saying things that are practically not uh, understandable. We also have criminals who we always forget they also understand the laws. Criminals know that this country doesn't talk to this country. So they know where to position themselves. They know where to channel, you know, monies to. And then, you know, they, they are waiting for the feds to, to take all forever to talk, you know, which will happen, which will not happen. So criminals also understand the law you also, you're also you know, holding, they know the weaknesses of these laws, and they have been able to take advantage. Don't forget they are intelligent people too. Yes, maybe they make mistakes. That's why we get, them, get to catch them, but they, pre they are pretty much good at what they are doing. That's why they've been able to go so far. The use of uh, VPNs also obscures from seeing very much and has been part of the challenge that uh, we have also noticed. Safe heavens, that's the one very important aspect of the challenge I want to talk about. They're destination countries. If you, t if you tell me that these crimes originate from Nigeria, 
So how come the monies move to some part of Asia, to some countries in Asia? The monies move to some countries in the Middle East before it gets. So it means that they have people like them in these countries. So if these monies get to your country, what do you do about it? Do you do next to nothing? Are you willing to work with another person who is saying there was a loss of money from this country and has moved to your country? The moment they know that whatever country it is, is no longer a safe heaven for financial, you know, monies moving to, yes. They, or if you open a bank account and then you, you, you aid the movement of that money to another person, you become liable. It becomes, you know, we begin to clamp down more on their activities. What's the way forward? Strongly collaboration. Commitments from countries that are, you know, strong to work with countries that uh, are, you know, less strong in terms of resources, in terms of technological uh, wise. From what we observe, these guys, when they talk online, sometimes they don't even know who they are talking to, but there's a lot of trust amongst them. They are talking, they, they say, who can tell me how I can hack into a bank without being noticed? You, you begin to see imputes from different, you know, people on their forum, how you can quickly do it without being noticed. You see better and more innovative ways of achieving it. But unfortunately, we, the good guys, are unable to talk, we're unable to share ideas, we're unable to support each other. So the way forward is collaboration. Now I talk about the instance of um, the initiative we had with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We work with them a lot. Um, early, early this year, they came with um, an initiative called the YWR Initiative. They wanted to do a joint operation with the EFCC. They also informed us that um, a lot of um, countries are also part of, of this um, operation, and the takedown was going to be simultaneous. And like usual, we were happy at that, and we jumped at it to work with them. So they sent the agents down with a lot of information. The EFCC went out, did surveillance. These are the countries that are involved. We have the United States there, we have Canada there, you have Poland, you have Malaysia, you have Mauritius, you have Indonesia, and of course you have Nigeria. So the point again is that all the BEC cases you see are not all settling in Nigeria. There are other countries too where it happens. Nobody's really proud of it, but you know that's the reality we have on our hands. So we had this joint um, operations with the FBI. Um, we gathered the intelligence, went out for the operation, and 29 of them at the instance in June were arrested. And, um, very much awaiting prosecution. And afterwards, the operation has been ongoing. Even when I left home, the operation has been ongoing and more people have been arrested. Um, like I said, these were multiple countries that were involved. That's a cross section of the guys that we arrested at the time. So these are actions that were very interested in carrying out. It was publicized, it was in the media everywhere. FBI arrest 74. In Nigeria, U.S., or then you know other places, in the body you see that the EFCC was also mentioned as part of what you know our contribution, and that's why we're very much interested in working with you know law enforcement agents uh, around the world. Uh, there's a guy in the middle there. I think he looks like somebody I know. Yeah, that's that's uh, we work together on that. Now, what did we learn? First, there was a message that we sent out to this fraudsters, these criminals, that these countries are not countries that are safe for you, even if you get to run out of Nigeria, even if you get to such countries, you are not also safe there. It's a message of deterrence that we sent. Second lesson we learned is that it is possible to work together. You, Even if you are from any country, it is possible to work with, like I said, the MLAT is a pretty very long process. <coughs> If we can work together, and the EFCC is foremost in, in, in its interest to work with any law enforcement agency from any country. Um, we also saw that you know, communicating police to police was, um, was, 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 was beautiful. There was a lot of information sharing. In the course of investigation, we gathered more in information from them, 
and I like to say, I, at a point, I even got to meet the guys, you know, the public, um, private sector guys who also provided the information to the FBI, and it was, it was, we're all very happy. Um, it produces a lot of result, and it's pretty very lasting. And uh, like I said, there are other law enforcement agencies that are interested in working with the EFCC. And um, on that note, I'd like to say a very big thank you. And if there are questions, I will be happy to take them.